Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. This is episode 107. We've had a short break, but we're really pleased to be back with you again today. Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, together with some little snippets of travel, history, and other strange stories to <laughs> add a little extra interest to your day and maybe put a smile on your face. And for new viewers... We're a husband and wife. We're Australian and we live in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got another really varied program for you today, which we're very excited about. The feature interview is with Julie Weisenberger, who is the founder of the company Coco Knits. Many of you will have heard of the Coco Knits method, which is a top-down seamless method of sweater knitting with a really particular way of constructing the shoulder. And this tailored shoulder technique is Julie's signature technique. So during the interview, she shows us exactly how to do it as well as how to modify it. And we also see lots of different Coco Knits designs. And I think they should really appeal to a broad range of knitters because most of them really aren't technically difficult to knit. And they're just kind of easy wearable pieces that are fairly easy to modify to suit your individual shape or your style. Coco Knits is also really known for their specialised knitting tools, which Julie designs herself, and she's completely passionate about her tools. She really lights up when she's talking about them. So it's a really fun, friendly, light-hearted interview for you to enjoy. Yep. Many of you really enjoyed our short segment on Strasbourg in the last episode. Yeah. So today <clears throat> we're really pleased to be taking you to the town of Colmar in the Alsace region in France. Colmar is the perfect chocolate box village with an abundance of charm. There's cobblestone streets lined with half-timbered medieval and early Renaissance buildings. It's also the birthplace of the sculptor Bartholdi, who designed the Statue of Liberty. So we're going to take you on a walk through the colourful streets, show you some of the stunning sights. And we're also going to give you a look at the uh, famous Renaissance masterpiece called the Isenheim Altarpiece. Yeah, and there's a really interesting story behind the Isenheim altarpiece. And because many of you have been enjoying Andrew's short detours into obscure, obscure topics, yep. <laughs> he's going to tell you about this story as well. And then there's an update on Andrew's lace, and I finished my Lonzo Lure, which I'm going to tell you about. And I've also prepared a short tutorial on steaked sandwiches. So it's a really full program for you. I'm continuing to make progress on my Bowie top by Lisa Richardson, and here is the completed back piece. I have mentioned in the past that this is around 25,000 stitches of stocking stitch. I'm impressed. I have persisted with my flicking technique, which I think is doing going pretty well. I haven't done any more timings. At some point, I just figured the stopwatch was not my friend. <laughs> We're not talking. I don't want to know, but it's going okay. So that's that. You can see in the back there is this little opening. It's kind of a teardrop shape like that. And that's pretty simple to do. Split into two parts here and then decreases and increases to get that shaping. Once the front and the back are hemmed together across the shoulder, then there is a, a sort of edging that comes right around the neckline and it also goes down through this opening here. It's just garter stitch. One point that I'm a little concerned about there is picking up the stitches. It's just something that makes me nervous. It's a bit weird, so I'll I, be... I can help you or I can yeah. show you or monitor you. I'll, I'll have you watching closely, supervising <laughs> to make sure I get that all good. But It's so stunning. Yeah, that's not an issue yet because I do still have to do the front another 25,000 stitches. <laughs> I've made a little start. It's not worth showing. <laughs> yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I've also finished the leafy lace sections of the two sleeves. So there's one... Here's the other. I blocked this last night. It's looking beautiful. And Andrea, that's the right side. I no, it's not. Oh, it is the right side. It's the pearls. You can see they're the pearl stitches. Oh. You have to look at the inside of the leaf. That's pearl. It's bumpy. And that's not. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think you're going to put it you on inside You can do amazing out. lace, Andrew, but some things you're still very basic so in. <laughs> I'll have you wearing the top upside yeah, down. Anyway. That's the, the leafy lace section and that's looking really good. That was really fun. I really enjoyed yeah. that. What I have to do to finish these I'll sleeves, show you, how it looks yeah, you can model it. And then what I have to do to finish is this lace edging, which actually gets knitted on sideways and we'll take the length down to the, just below the elbow. So you can kind of imagine it like this. It's going to be an utterly glamorous design. This it, is just it looks like it's beautiful pretty much and simple. Done, doesn't it? it does. And then this has got its little hoop in it, so it's sticking out. But yep. 
You can imagine with the, the more lace coming down here, the sleeve is just so elegant. Yep, it's going to be beautiful. So I'm figuring I'm at least halfway through this project because that was pretty slow going. So I'm, the next bit I think will be easier. So still got a bit to go, but it's getting there. Yeah, I really hope that lace is easier. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Well, I think it will. It's at least shorter rows because these are quite yep. long rows in the end. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to having it finished. I did figure summer has sort of disappeared it's actually quite a nice day today but the temperature has dropped drastically in the last couple of weeks so i am thinking andrea when i do get it finished we're just going to have to go to a really nice restaurant so that you can try it somewhere special yeah. somewhere special where they have good heating yes <laughs> definitely because there's nothing to this yeah it's very shimmery that's right uh so mm -hmm. that's my bowie top by lisa richardson now i am i may be getting ahead of myself but i am starting to think about what project I might do next and I figured out that my younger sister is actually heading towards her 50th birthday so I thought I would do something nice for her now she lives in Sydney which is pretty much warm all the time I yeah. think winter is not very cold it can easily be 22 degrees yeah yeah it's not like Germany like warmer than a Danish summer that's right yeah <laughs> uh, so I'm looking at something really light so I'm thinking a light scarf or a light shawl um and really thinking of something that's more glamorous and, and elegant than practical, um, special occasion, not everyday wear. Yeah. And so. Andrea, Andrea actually pointed me in the direction of Louisa Harding, which was a really good suggestion. You might remember we, or Andrea, interviewed Louisa in episode 59. And if I had to describe her designs in one word, I'd have to say elegant. There's a lot of lace there, very feminine, very beautiful. Yeah, I'd uh, say feminine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true too. Louise has actually developed two yarns of her own to um, complement her designs. They're both 100% cashmere. There's one called the Cashmere Gilly is a DK weight yarn. I thought it was just mild colors, but you say they're mild and, and solid. And solid, Okay. Yeah. So that's the Cashmere Gilly DK weight. She also has the Cashmere Lace, which is a lace weight yarn. And I'm sure that's only solid colors. And they're completely sophisticated colors. They're just stunning to dye for yarns. Uh, one, one other thing that I like about both Louisa and her yarns, they both have a very strong Yorkshire heritage, which I think is a good thing in a yarn. We'll have to visit her sometime. We, would, we should visit her yeah. when we can travel. Uh, so Andrea pulled out this book. We actually had this in our library. It's really nice to go through designs that we've already got. So I yeah. really like that. In, all our of, in our library. Yeah, that's right. In um, All of the designs in here use Louise's yarn only. And one nice thing is that they're all designed with a fairly loose gauge to get a nice drape. Like Andrea said, they're really feminine, really light. That means that it's not that much knitting. Yeah, it's they're amazing. They're quite manageable, which is a really good thing. Yeah, Good so thing. she will be, even though her yarns will be very thin, like a lace weight, she's knitting them sometimes on four millimetre or five millimetre needles, which is extraordinary. So yeah. it just won't take that long. So it's a big bang for your buck. Yeah. So there are shawls and scarves and tops and some hats. In this book. Yeah, yeah. in this book. So I wanted to show you some of the contenders that I've picked out. This design here was my early favorite. It's called Odella, and I think it looks really elegant, but it also looks like it wouldn't be too challenging. The pattern has directions for either one ball of Louise's lace yarn or two balls of the DK weight yarn. The lace weight's knitted on five millimeter needles or US eight, and the DK weight is knitted on six millimeter or US 10 needles. There are only 68 stitches in a row and it's only a 10 row pattern repeat, which is sounds really easy to me right now. My current pattern is 84, uh, 84 rows long. There's some repetition in there, but it's really hard to recognize. So it was pretty difficult. So this one here should be pretty easy. It'll be so much easier than yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So that's one possibility. Andrea is trying to push me onto this one here. Her idea is that we do this or that I do this for my elder sister. Um, Andrea does have a tendency to get my queue pretty full, which is a bit overwhelming for me, but I'm considering it. This one is a great one to knit as a gift because it's a simple loose fitting shawl cardigan. So the sizing doesn't have to be too exact. Of course, I can't do any fittings with my sister. So that works well. It's called a diva and it's done in the DK weight cashmere gilly yarn on four and a half millimeter needles. It's also going to be a quick knit. It's a really interesting construction. The lace shawl section, which is the front and the shawl collar is knitted up first. And then you pick up stitches along the back and knit down. And then for the sleeves, you pick up and knit 
outwards. I don't understand it entirely, but it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, and that would be a fun one to do. This last one, Andrea really loves. I was a little bit slow to take it on, but I'm also warming up to this. It looks really sophisticated and it looks like a lot of work, but again, I was surprised to see that there are only about a hundred stitches in a row, which again, compared to my current project, with uh, that came to about 250 stitches in a row on that sleeve. Um, this one's relatively easy, particularly when you see that the middle section is all stocking stitch. So that's really good. It uses two balls of Louise's cashmere, base, uh, cashmere lace yarn on four millimeter needles. Yeah, and I really love the way this is, it can be worn as a shawl or a shawl cape with those buttons down the front. Yeah. That is really interesting and very yeah. elegant. And we've got a machine knitting cull on at the moment. And for those machine knitters out there, this is a project I think that could really be adapted to machine knitting mm -hmm. because you've got this long central rectangle to, rectangle which is just pure stocking stitch so yep. you could even just do that on machine knitting and hand knit the lace border on or depending on how how skilled you are just do it as well on the machine but this is something that we could do for you we could divide the project up so that because at night time in front of television you just like to do stocking stitch so you just yep. do that center panel and then at the same time you could knit on the border I haven't had any experience of doing this, but this is a really typical Shetland uh, way of knitting a, a lace shawl yeah. is they, lit, they, they knit on the lace border and that's actually what you'll be doing here. So I'll read this pattern, figure out how to do it and, and show you. But also I think in this book here, this is the heirloom knitting. It's a Shetland lace pattern and workbook by uh, Sharon Miller. I'm sure it tells you how to do it in here. So we could just kind of rework that pattern yep. so that you've got the perfect project. So at night time, you just knit up the 50 stitches because it's only 50 stitches wide mm -hmm. across of the stocking stitch. And then at a slower pace when during the day or when you've got more concentration, you can just knit on the lace border. Yep. That would be perfectly suited to I think to that's you. an excellent approach. So we get to use our bring and brag title because I've finally finished a garment. It doesn't happen that often. No. <laughs> this I'm really happy to show you off my Lonzo Lul by Jennifer Bill, which I've recently finished. Yay. Mm. It was such a fun, super fun trip knitting this, this design. And I totally love how unique it looks. It's, um, it's definitely a modern looking garment. So it looks very modern, but at the same time, there's a slight costume look about it. Uh, has a, a costume feel about it, which is totally my style. So if you look at this lacy hem here, it's very elegant and the lacy cuffs, that has a slight Baroque feel to me. And then this trimming here just reminds me of a thick velvet ribbon as trimming. And I, I think that's just gorgeous as well. And then this color work panel that runs down the top of the sleeves, whenever I look at that, I just think of tapestry. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it's amazing. And this motive here, it's a eight leaf rose and it's got sort of ivy trailing around it. And this kind of patterning is very reminiscent of patterning from the Tudor period. So I just love all of these little details. And the yarn as well, the yarn is stunning. It's John Arvin's sport weight yarn, Yarn Adelic, which comes in totally to dye for colors. Mm -hmm. And I love these two colors together. This is the pink moon and this color here, the contrast color is Baddy Da. And when I look at these two together and the, this Baddy Da is a inky greeny blue. When I see it against the sort of the pink here, peachy pink, it just reminds me of tattoos. I always look at it and think tattoos. So this whole design is giving me very fanciful, eclectic imagery, <laughs> which is really fun. So I have done some minor modifications to this design, as I've told you about in previous episodes. If you want to hear all the, the full on details about it, they're in the recent episodes that we've just done. But um, by far the most challenging thing I did was to rework all of the maths and calculations to fit a gauge that was completely different to what the recommended pa the, the recommended gauge of the pattern. Uh, so my gauge was much smaller. And it was particularly challenging with this design because it was such a crazy construction and you're knitting in all different directions. So sometimes your row gauge will give you the length and other times your row gauge will give you the width because you're knitting 
in a different direction and your stitch gauge will give you the length. So that's really important to know what's happening with the fabric. And also you've got two, or you've actually got three types of fabric. You've got the, the lace rib down here, but in the main part of the body, you've got stocking stitch, which has got a certain amount of elasticity to it. And then you've got these panels of um, color work, which are going to be a little slightly stiffer and have less elasticity to them. So you have to make, depending on where they're running and how much stretch they're meant to have, because there's one under there as well, you've got to totally make sure that your calculations are exactly right so that when you put it all together, the proportions are right. So that was really challenging for me, but I did go into this project with that challenge in mind because I wanted to really expand my skills in that area because I've done, a, I've changed a lot of gauges on basic constructions, but nothing on a really fanciful construction. So it was pretty challenging at first, a bit scary, but I've detected a bit of challenge there. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of fear. Oh my goodness, yeah. is it going to work? But it did. And so I do feel a lot more confident. So it's been a really good exercise to do. Yeah. And as I've said quite a few times, this is definitely, this design is definitely a study in steaking. You steak all over the place in all different directions. So if you knit th this design, you will definitely, um, you'll be a master of steaking and you will have lost all fear of steaking. Oh, excuse me. So when you're doing your colour work, to do it in the round and add steaking stitches is fantastic for eliminating doing purling when you're doing colour work. But... The downside is, is that you'll always end up with an edge that's slightly bulky and slightly frayed that has to be finished off properly. And on this design here, on the sleeves, you've, you actually end up with four steep edges. So you've got one here, there, there, and underneath. And they're all, so those edges are all slightly bulky and slightly frayed and they have to be finished off well. And Jennifer finishes them off well in, with such a creative idea. She does this steak sandwich around here and she turns it into a major design feature. And it's actually my favorite part of the garment. I love what she's done here. I think that's so creative. And it's such an interesting technique. So I've done a short tutorial showing you how to do a steak sandwich in a very abridged version. Because I thought it's so interesting once you understand the concept of how it's done, it's a kind of technique that you can apply to all kinds of knitting all over the place <laughs> <laughs> and have a lot of fun with. So, um, yeah, so that, that tutorial is coming up very shortly. But first of all, I want to show you how I finished off some of the other steaks on the inside. So here's a picture of the inside of the garment and what you're looking at is the colour work panel that runs down the top of the sleeve. So it's going from the lacy neckband down to the cuff and you're seeing where the steak joins the lacy neckband. So the picture on the left shows the steak end uncovered. So you can see that it's just been reinforced on the sewing machine but it hasn't been covered yet. And on the right, I've covered it. And Jennifer gives you the option of finishing the steak in two ways. You can pick up stitches and knit a flap of facing to cover up the steak end or you can sew down a piece of ribbon. And I chose the ribbon option. And I did that because, first of all, it's a pretty ribbon and it's really fast and easy to do, but also a ribbon I thought was going to be thinner and create less bulk, so lay flatter. So I hope you've enjoyed coming along on the ride with me with this garment. I've totally enjoyed taking you on the journey and describing the whole process. <laughs> This design is Lons or Lul by Jennifer Bill, and my favorite thing about the design is how she finishes the cuffs and that's what I'm going to show you in this tutorial. So the right sleeve cuff here is completely finished and I'm going to go through the steps with you on the left sleeve cuff. So all the color work in this design was worked in the round with steaks which were then reinforced with the sewing machine and cut open. So there's four cut steaked edges at the end of this cuff. So this band of color work here was joined to the band of color work on the other side here and then cut open. And there was a steak at the end of this band of color work which was cut and there's a, a band of color work that goes underneath the sleeve and there was a steak at the end of that. 
So that means that we don't have a nice neat cuff edge of either cast on or cast off stitches. Instead, we have four edges that have been reinforced with the sewing machine. You can see the sewing machine stitches there and there in white and across here. And we've got a little bit of extra bulky frayed material on the other side that needs to be covered up in a nice neat way. And Jennifer uses the bulk of the steaks to very good effect by making them into a plump steak sandwich. That's what a plump steak sandwich looks like here. So what I'm gonna do is pick up stitches all around the cuff and I'm going to knit a layer of material from the front side upwards and a layer of material from the back side upwards and at the top I'll join them together and the steak edge will be neatly covered. So the first step is to pick up stitches right around the edge of the cuff and you can see the sewing machine stitches here in white going down the edge of this steak here. The next column of stitches inwards, so this column of pink stitches here, is part of the real garment and I'm going to pick up my stitches in between that column of stitches and the one further in, so the one that's got a pattern on it already. So I'm going to put my needle right through in the middle of those two columns to pick up my stitches. Now how you often pick up stitches is putting the needle through two legs of the stitch like that and then knitting it. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is put the end of the needle right through to the other side of the fabric and then knit it. If I pick up the stitches in this way, it means that for every stitch that I pick up on the right side of the fabric, there's going to be a little stitch on the back side of the fabric, which I'm going to pick up and use later. So after I picked up all the stitches around the cuff, the very first row is a purl row and that gives it a really nice finish or edge. You can see that there, the first row here is a purl row. And then I knit stocking stitch for about a centimetre and that's the front layer finished. So now I have to do an inside layer and if I turn it over to the wrong side you can see that for every stitch that I picked up on the front side there's now a little stitch on the back and I'm going to pick up and knit into all of these little stitches on the back side and I'll knit from those stitches the inside layer. This method of picking up stitches is really great because it means I don't have to worry about picking up exactly the same count of stitches on the back side as I did on the front side. And I also don't need to worry about spacing the stitches out evenly in the same way as I did on the front. And that's because on the back side I'm actually picking up the very same stitch that I first made on the front side. So after I picked up all of the stitches on the inside, I knitted the inside layer to the length of one row less than the outside layer. So there's the inside layer, there's the steak in the middle, and there's the outside layer. That means that when I join both layers together to cover up the steak, because the inside layer is shorter, it will lay flat and the outside layer will sort of slightly curve around it and the whole thing will sit neater. You can see that there. The next bit is a bit fiddly and it takes quite a bit of time, but what I'm going to do is with the right side facing me, I'm going to join both layers together. So there's the outside layer, there's the squashed in steak, and I'm going to do that by purling one stitch from the outside layer together with one stitch from the inside layer. I've just done that little bit there and you can see what that looks like. So what that's going to give me is a, ro a purl row right here that matches the purl row that goes along this edge. So as I'm knitting along, I'm going to stuff in a little bit of extra bit of waste yarn in between the two layers where there's no steak edge. You might remember I had four steak uh, edges and that meant I had four little corners that didn't have any extra material. And so I need to put a bit of waste yarn into those corners just to make sure that it's padded in an even way and not lumpy bumpy. So the steak sandwich is now completed. The frayed edges of the steaks are all sandwiched in between the two layers and everything's really neat. You can see that looks great on the inside and the outside. So now what I have to do, I've still got my live stitches. I need to knit down 
the cuff, so it's a lacy ribbed cuff with an I-cord bind off. The cuffs are both finished now. I really love the way they look. I think they look so elegant and I really hope you enjoyed seeing the process. <laughs> We're now going to take you on a tour of Colmar, which is a really beautiful town in the Alsace area of France. But before we do, I do want to tell you the story behind an incredible piece of Renaissance art that we saw in a museum there. This is the Isenheim altarpiece. It was painted by the German painter Matthias Grunewald around 1512. This is what's known as a polyptych. A polyptych is a painting which is divided into multiple panels with wings that can be opened up to show different views. There are actually three views to this piece. Most of the time, the wings of the altarpiece were kept closed, showing this scene of the crucifixion of Christ. The base there is known as the predella and it shows the entombment of Christ. On some days in the religious cal calendar, particularly days that are in honour of the Virgin Mary, the uh, outer panels of the altarpiece are opened out to show the second view. In this view, the left panel shows the Archangel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she's going to give birth to Jesus Christ. The centre panel shows the birth of Jesus, and I really like this. You can see the chamber pot there, and that's included to stress the fact that Christ is human. The final panel shows the resurrection and Christ's ascension to heaven. And then there's a second set of wings that open up to reveal the third innermost view. This view includes sculptures of the 12 apostles in the predella, and these sculptures are done by Nicholas of Hagenau. But the scene focuses on St. Anthony, who's seated in place of honour in the centre panel, also a carving, but he also features in the paintings on the two outer panels. And we're going to come back to St. Anthony in just a moment. Now, this piece is huge. It's 10 feet high, and when the panels are open out, it's about 15 feet wide. So it is really impressive. It's yeah, spectacular. It is. Right? Really impressive. But to continue with our story, we need to go back to the first view. The centre panel here obviously shows the crucifixion of Christ, but if we zoom in, you can see that there's something a little bit unusual about this picture. Christ has sores on his skin. He's, he's actually got a skin disease. Now the question is, why is this? Well, this piece was created in the 16th century for the Monastery of St. Anthony in Isenheim, which is just a short distance from Colmar. Now, the Order of St. Anthony was founded around 1095 AD, and it was actually created specifically to care for patients and victims of skin diseases, which were very common in the, the Middle Ages. And by the end of the Middle Ages, the Order was running nearly 400 hospitals right across Europe. So if we look at the full picture again, we have Christ in the centre panel. On the right-hand panel, we can see St. Anthony himself. Now, he was considered a healer of skin diseases. On the left panel, we see St. Sebastian, and he was believed to provide protection from the plague. So in this picture, which was located in the hospital chapel, it was created to provide consolation and comfort to patients at the hospital, with the two protecting saints on either side and Christ with a skin disease sharing in their suffering in the center. Now, one of the diseases most commonly treated at the hospital was known as St. Anthony's fire. And um, the symptoms included, well, the fire in the name referred to the, the burning sensation that victims would feel in their limbs. The disease restricted blood flow and ultimately it caused gangrene, but it also attacked the central nervous system. So it caused muscle spasms and it caused hallucinations and mania. Friars of the Order of St. Anthony were known for their expertise in treating this disease. And um, one of the treatments they used was a concoction of holy wine called St. Vinage. And it included a mixture of medicinal herbs. So there were herbs that eased the pain and there were herbs that increased the, the blood flow. Which actually worked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they also... The friars also soaked relics of St. Anthony in the holy wine to um, gain the healing benefits of the relics. And this use of religious practices and relics for healing is known as hagiotherapy. This what disease, a great name. <laughs> check your insurance, you know, <laughs> see if you can get that on your insurance. Um, the, the disease, St. Anthony's fire, is what it was called then, and that's why it's the Order of St. Anthony. Or, other way around. The Order of St. Anthony led to the name St. Anthony's Fire, but the modern name is ergotism, and it's caused by poisoning by the ergot fungus, which is a fungus that mainly occurs on rye grain. 
Now, this picture here shows it's actually barley with some affected grains. The scientific name for the fungus is Claviceps purpurea. Sounds Which... like purple, purple. And you can actually see there is a slight purple color in the affected grains. The fungus also contains a chemical which is actually a precursor to LSD. And that's why you have the symptoms of the poisoning, including hallucinations and mania. Now, in the Middle Ages, the grain that was mainly used for making bread on the continental Europe, on continental Europe, was rye. And that's why you see this disease in France, but also in Germany, in Italy and Spain. But not in the UK. Not in the UK. In the UK, bread was generally made out of wheat. And so the disease doesn't appear in the UK. Now, the tragedy is that it seems like it's quite easy to avoid ergot poisoning. I mean, the disease was awful, but... It's, it would have been easy to avoid. You take a handful of grain and put it in some salty water, the affected grains float to the top and the healthy grains fall down. So you can detect that it's there. And once you know that it's in a crop of grain, you can clear the field, right? If you just plow the field more deeply, then the fungus will be eliminated. It can't survive that. The other possibility is simply to grow a different crop for a year. And then again, the fungus will die out. And it's so tragic okay. that they suffered it's, so much and there was such an it's, easy, simple, it's inexpensive it's solution. It's heartbreaking, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, the, the problem was that they didn't know. They didn't know that the grain was causing the disease. And it wasn't until the late 16th century that somebody made the connection between these affected grains and the disease. And once they found that, the disease was eliminated almost immediately. And actually, the Order of St. Anthony kind of went out of business, um, which is probably a good thing. But the disease still actually shows up every so often. There was an outbreak in 1951 in France, and it was actually quite a mystery because they hadn't seen it for hundreds of years. They didn't know what was going on, but people were suffering from hallucinations. And it, it sounds awful. And there were, I think there were five deaths, but eventually they figured it out. There was another outbreak in Ethiopia in 2001. So... Okay, so the disease had gone from human memory or records, in a sense, yeah. and then it turns up a bit and they've the, got to rediscover yeah, it. The fungus still exists in wild crops, Okay. so in wild yeah. plants, but it's, it's pretty safe in normal, yeah. normal plantations. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's a, it's a happy ending, but oh, it's yeah. so tragic, isn't but, it? Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's St Anthony's fire and the story behind this Isenheim altarpiece. Which is, you're going to see again it's really really beautiful so yeah. you'll enjoy seeing that and you'll enjoy seeing the rest of Colma so that's coming up now and as Andrew said earlier Colma is also the birthplace of the sculptor what's his name now for Frederick I'm trying to think of his first name Frederick Augusta Bartholdi yeah. who created the Statue of Liberty yeah. and Bartholdi's house in Colmar is now a museum which has a lot of his works in it and it was interesting for me because I certainly didn't know who Bartholdi was and I certainly couldn't say who created the Statue of Liberty but we went to the museum because we thought uh, some of our American viewers would enjoy seeing Bartholdi's birthplace and it was interesting to find out that Bartholdi was actually very passionate about um, Philosophy. So he was passionate about independence, liberty, and self determination in particular. And most of his sculptures were actually symbolizing these ideals in relation to certain historical events where the locals became more self-determined or had more liberty. Yep. So that was a kind of an interesting connection to read about. So enjoy that. And straight after that, I'm going to tell you about my new project. But actually, beforehand, for music lovers, the music you're going to hear is Eccles' Violin Sonata in G minor. And whether you're a music lover or not, you're going to recognise this music because the opening and the ending you hear every time I do a tutorial. And I've just done a tutorial, so it'll still be ringing in your ears. <laughs> One last thing. This music was written well after uh, they found the scientific cure for St. Anthony's fire. So it is really happy and really celebratory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that absolutely magical 13th century cloister garden at the end. I was filming that and I was alone then, which was wonderful. It was just felt so special to be in that beautiful kind of spiritual place. It's been a place of meditation for 700 years and it just had that atmosphere. It was yeah. very, very special to, to, to be there alone and filming in, in there. Yeah, that's where the museum was. Yeah. Yeah. In the old part of the museum. Yeah. And it was also great to see the altarpiece in person, especially since they were renovating it and they'd pulled it apart so you could really see how big it was and how it was constructed. So I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, so I'm always excited when I'm starting a new project and I'm particularly excited when I'm knitting it in a radical green like this <laughs> with iridescent pops of contrast in colour. It's a very psychedelic work, yeah, yeah. this one. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm just going to briefly tell you about this project today and I'll go into a lot more technical details about it in the future episodes. So here's a picture of it. The design is called the Paisley Kofta and it's by Cicel Hujevic, who we've had on the show a few times already. And this jacket uses three stunning greens together, so I'm really in heaven. There's a lime green, an apple green and an olive green. Cicel also really loves the colour green. And she sent me this photo here, which was the inspiration for the jacket. So a friend of hers sent her the photo a few years ago and Cecil loved it so much that she decided to base uh, her new design on it, which is the Paisley jacket. The name is Paisley Kofta and Kofta actually just means jacket. So Cecil's jacket is quite different, but you can definitely see the connection with this photo. So the green one was made first and then Cecil made a version of in lavender blue, which a little bit later. And I think the blue one is also completely stunning, but the green one definitely had my name on it. So long-term viewers will know that I've actually already knitted a green jacket by Cecil Hujevic and that's this one here. This is the Mother Erst Kofta and I knitted that a few years back. I love it. it. The yarn wears really, really well. It still looks brand new, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, and I wear it quite a lot. I heavily modified the shape of this garment, so I've made it into a cropped jacket and I also added a collar on it, but the color work and all of the, the coloring itself is true to the original design. Yeah, so the colors in that are also great. They're stunning. Together with the buttons. Yeah, yep. it's really great. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Sissel's patterns come in a kit with everything you need. So here's mine, all of the yarn. There's the three colours. That's the lime and the apple and... Olive. And the olive. There's lime and apple. I think, yeah, that's the apple, that's the lime and that's the olive. And then the three contrasting colours is this sort of purpley pink, purple and blue. So that's all the yarn that I'm using. It also comes with lovely buttons. Uh, might, might be able to get a few out for you to show you. So lovely purple buttons that go down the front and also some sequences here. Sequins. Sequins. <laughs> so one of the reasons why I picked this design was that after you've done all of the knitting, you actually get to do some embroidery on your knitting and sew on some sequences. And I've never done that before. Sew on some sequins. And I've never done that before. So I'm really looking forward to doing that, which is going to be new for me. So this is what I've done so far. That's the back. And the back and the sleeves have this checkered pattern running all over it. It's very easy to memorize checkered pattern. So there it is there. And the front has two panels of paisley, different uh, paisley designs running down the front of it. And when I'm finished, and these lines here, that's my sticking stitches, so I'll just be cutting them and trimming them back. But when you finish knitting it, can you just hold it for me for a second? Yes, of course. Okay. I'm going to be using the, the pink and the purple, I think. So It's so psychedelic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be uh, embroidering the outline of these paisley shapes here. And then with the sequences and the what are they called, uh, sequins, there's little, there's little white ones and, and purple ones. They're going to go in the middle of all these little flowers in here. So that's going to kind of be fun. I've never done that before, so it'll be interesting to see how it works out. So what um, it's knitted in the round, bottom up, and if you can just hold that for me here as well, 
what Cecil does here, so that's the, that's the armhole and then my armhole steaks here, but she has a column of pearl stitches where the side seams would be, so it's acting like a faux side seam. And what that enables you to do is do your waist shaping. So doing your, I've just done increases here, but decreases or increases so that the pattern doesn't get sort of muddied or, or messed up here. So you can do it on either side of the pearl stitch. The pearl stitch is done in the background color. So that's a neat trick and, and she does that on all of her designs. The other thing that's really interesting about this design is how she does the hem. So it starts off with this, I've partly him, um, pinned it up and partly haven't, but it starts off, you start off knitting this lining here in the, which is the, the bright pink. And that's just pure stocking stitch. I'll hold it upside down. So you're knitting back and forward flat in that. So knitting and purling stocking stitch until you've got it the length that you want. And then this is going to end up being turned underneath and pinned down and sewn down. I've just pinned it there for you to see. Okay, so you won't see it in the end. So here it's at the front, it's been pinned down underneath and that's what it's gonna look like. And you do that right at the end. So first of all, you knit the, the lining then you join your knitting in the round, you add your steaking stitches here, if you hold that again for me, and you continue doing the whole thing, the whole body in, in the round. So that's kind of cool. And another little detail that she does with this lining is she does the first row in stocking stitch, and then she does one row of purl, and then she continues on in stocking stitch. And what that does is it, that's the fold line, and it makes the fold line really crisp instead of just sort of being a loose um, rounded edge, it's like you've steamed it and it's really crisp. The other thing this lining does, which I think is cool, it's a bit like sewing, it acts like interfacing. So you have it here on the hem and here around the cuff and that's particularly good on a jacket because you just want a little bit of extra um, sturdiness and, and stiffness there. Mm. So there you go. It's so <laughs> psychedelic, <Yeah. laughs> but it's going to be fun. I think just wearing it over it like a crisp white shirt is going to look pretty cool. So I'm excited to I'm I'm excited to tell you more details about it because there is quite a lot of technical things involved in it. So there'll be lots of good stuff to talk about. But I just wanted to give you an overview today. So working on the show is really a full-time job, both for Andrew and myself, and we're only able to do that thanks to the ongoing support of our patrons. It is really easy to become a patron. It only takes a small, regular, monthly contribution to do so. It's a difficult time. Every single patron does make a big difference to us, and we are really relying on those people who are watching to make a contribution. So please do become a patron, and thank you so much to all of the wonderful viewers who have done that. So we do have some happy news to share with you. As we all know, so many knitting festivals and events have been cancelled this year. We had planned to go to two new festivals this year. We were going to the Danish Fanu Festival in mid-September and straight after that we were going to the very first Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival in Canada, which we were super excited about. Yeah. Well, yeah. So the Prince Edward Fibre Festival got cancelled fairly early on, I think back in spring already. But the Danish Fernu Festival decided to go ahead because all of the borders here in, in Europe are open and they sort of were able to rearrange their event and planning so that there'd be a lot more space inside and some of the events would even be outside. So because they were going to go ahead, we decided we'd go ahead too with our planning and we'd go to the Fernu Festival and we thought we'll drive up there because it's a little bit safer than, than flying. And so we started to prepare and research a whole lot of interviews, which we have been doing over the last three months. Unfortunately, just two weeks ago, the Fanu Festival said that they were going to cancel. And this was because they weren't going to get the attendance that they needed to cover the costs of running the show. And that's probably because they were expecting to get more visitors from the States and, and that may International, have, yeah. Yeah, and that has fallen through. So that was a, a real blow to us. But because we had already uh, booked our accommodation and it would be difficult to get 
the, we would lose a fair bit of money by cancelling and we'd already put in many, many hours organising interviews. We've decided we're going to go up there anyway. And I think there is going to be a few knitters in our position where they don't want to lose money from their accommodation, so they're going to go there. So I think there'll be some sort of informal gatherings, knitting gatherings and events that are going on. We will, we're will we going there because we will still be able to do some of the interviews that we've planned yeah. and with the locals, and that's good. And and um, Crystal Seifarth, who's one of the organisers, has gone out of her way to also put us in touch with some of the local cultural events for us to cover, do footage of and do short little mini interviews with. So that'll also make it worthwhile. So what we're thinking is that even though we won't be covering the Fair New Festival, we'll be giving you a very close idea of what it would be like to go there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we should still come back with a lot of really good stuff, <laughs> content. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're kind of fortunate because a lot of the stuff that we had prepared, we can still do. Well, not everything. Yeah, but, not everything. And, and but... some of the really big uh, yeah, we obviously miss the, the very excitement of the actual event that's yeah. happening and, and those activities that they're not going to be able to see. But some of the things that would have been side events that, that visitors could go and do, we are able to go and film. And in a way, it could even be an advantage because there'll be less people and their time won't be so spread amongst other people. We'll be able to hone in and get a good version for you. So I do have some really exciting stuff lined up. And I think it's worth going because so many of our viewers have never been to the Fair New Festival and it just gives a different feel. It's a Scandinavian festival and that I'm sure so many of you would be really interested in seeing that. So we're going to drive, take the very long drive up to Denmark. I hate driving this weekend to do that. And when we go away on festivals like this to do interviews, we really are working from morning till late at night because when you go to a festival, you've got to drive there, go to an interview, you've got to drive there, you've got to set all your equipment up, which takes quite a long time. The filming of the interview is always two to three times longer than what you'll get to see in the edited version. And then you're packing it up. And then in the evenings, Andrew is downloading all the footage and there's a ton, like how many gigabytes? Uh. A lot, a lot. A lot. And then backing all that up so we don't lose yeah. the footage because it would be so sad to lose it and then filing it so that we can find it appropriately later. So it's a lot of work. In other words, what we're saying is the whole time we're there, we will not be able to work on the next episode. We can't start working on that till we get back. So the next episode is going to be delayed, but we're going to have lots of new exciting content for you. <laughs> okay, so coming up now is our interview with Julie Weisenberger. Yep, that's right. So Julie is the founder of Coco Knits and if you've been considering doing a Coco Knits design, then you're going to find out exactly what that involves in this um, interview. It's really interesting. And one of the particular features I think of this technique is that Julie really shows you how to handle fitting issues mm. that you might have. I think that's a really valuable thing. And mm. she goes through that again in this interview. Yeah. So. And that's a problem that a lot of people struggle with. So I think this is a really good opportunity to see. You could learn to do this on one of her designs and then you can apply it to all kinds of things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Julie is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all the Coco Knits designs from the Coco Knits website. So all the patterns are PDF downloads and she's got a great selection of sweaters, cardigans, wraps and even some shoes and slippers. So enjoy looking through them and thanks to Julie. Yep. So that's it from us for today. The interview's coming up. Thank you for being with us again um, after our little break and we will see you in very soon. soon. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. See you. Bye.
Welcome to Fruity Knitting. My guest today is the knitwear designer and founder of Coco Knits, Julie Weisenberger. Julie has developed a seamless top-down and tailored method of sweater construction, which she calls the Coco Knits method. And it's described in a lot of detail in her book, Coco Knits Sweater Workshop. Her company has also developed a high quality line of tools to make the process of knitting these coconut sweaters very pleasurable and a lot easier. Julie's been in the knitwear industry since the 1980s. She's seen a lot of changes over this time and she's also had a lot of teaching experience. And what drives her is helping knitters become very happy and successful garment knitters. So Julie, we've got a lot to cover today. I'm very <laughs> excited to be interviewing you. So thank you for being on Fruity Knitting. Thank you for having me and happy to be here. So you've had a very interesting career. Back in the 1990s, up uh, 1980s actually, you ran your own knitwear company and you were employing cottage machine knitters in Ireland and selling ready-made garments in boutiques. So tell us briefly about that experience and then how that eventually led on to your company, Coco Knits. So I learned to knit in Austria when I was living in Austria. Um, and I was taught, when I went in, they cut my, I sort of gave them the measurements and they cut it out of butcher paper. And then I just laid my knitting on top of the butcher paper. If it went out, I increased. If it went in, I decreased. And that was just how I learned to knit. So I didn't really knit from a pattern. Um, so I had sort of started to just design my own in a way, like from the beginning. Um, I also learned to knit in German. So when I came back to the U.S., I, I didn't know any English knitting terms. In fact, I didn't learn English knitting terms until I started to write patterns in English. Okay. <laughs> so I just sort of was winging it um, from the beginning, and it turned out I had that kind of brain. A lot of people are like, what do you mean you just started knitting? Um, it's, it, it's how my brain works, too. So... Um, I came back to the US, I was trying to figure out how I could just knit all the time, basically. Uh, and I was wearing my sweaters, a friend of mine who worked in a boutique, the owner of the boutique uh, was interested in, in buying some from me. So it led to this whole thing of figuring out where I could have them made. I wound up having knitters in Ireland who knitted my designs and then I sold them to boutiques in the US. Um, Nordstrom and Henry Vendel and Mark Shale, which is long gone, and a lot of smaller boutiques. Uh, the th a couple of things changed. First was China came on the scene, and suddenly hand knits were much less expensive. I mean, they just the prices just plummeted. And it also was not creatively fulfilling for me to be running the business that way because I was constantly having to oversee. Um, the production and there was invoicing and billing and shipping and it was just not not creatively fulfilling yeah and so I was okay when China came in and ruined the whole thing I was like that's okay I'm ready to move on <laughs> um, so then I started to design for hand knitters that's when I learned English terminology and at the time you know so now we're like maybe early 90s late 80s early 90s everything had been super oversized, just crazy big squares, basically, yeah. with sleeves knitted onto it. Yeah, so then it, things started to also change and become a little more tailored. Um, and so my designing changed uh, and eventually got to the point where I was teaching at first and this seamless started to happen and I was like well I don't mind seaming but then once you've done a seamless sweater it's sort of like oh this is nice like to finish it and it's done um, I also have always really liked the English tailoring that I use yeah and the next step was to figure out how I could use the English tailoring seamless and the next step was to get it top down and it was just a trick it was sort of a puzzle that I wanted to figure out for myself um, and it turned out I was able to do it. I had, you know, it, was a, it took a while. Um, but that sort of led then to, I had been doing patterns and at the same time sort of developing the tools and then came the book. And so at this point now, coconuts is knitting patterns. A lot of them, the coconuts method, which is top down and seamless with that nice shaped English shoulder. 
Um, and then also all the tools. So um, high quality, eco-friendly, hopefully beautiful and helpful tools. So that's what Coconuts has become. And you're well known for the seamless top-down Coconuts method with the tailored shoulder. And so that's your signature technique. Can you describe that method to us and also just talk us through the anatomy of a typical cocoa knit sweater? Okay, so the advantages of doing the English tailored shoulder are that it creates a little pocket for your shoulder to sit in. So instead of knitting something that's basically designed for a paper doll, completely flat, this is the difference of wearing a tube sock and wearing a sock that has a heel turned in it. So you actually have a little 3D pocket here for your shoulder to sit in. The other reason I really like it is it pushes this, what would be a seam or the join, off to the back of your shoulder. It doesn't sit up on top and um, leave that big bulky seam sitting right up at the top of your shoulder. It pushes it to the back. So it's a really nice clean finish that um, actually fits a body instead of a flat, like a, a flat sewing pattern. So that's why I really like it. That's the advantage to it. And then the way you achieve this is we start with the upper back, this little cream area right here. And you're going to Start with a cast on and knit that upper back. So that's what you're gonna come up with to start with. And then you're gonna pick up along each of these. This one I've already, I've just picked it up. You're gonna make a little shoulder tab that comes up and over your shoulder. And okay. that's what starts to give you that 3D shaping that's more comfortable. And then you're gonna wind up with, so there it is, there's one that is, has both of the shoulder tabs knitted. Okay, I see, yeah right? And then you're going to come around. This one I just joined. So you're going to come around, pick up stitches now along the side of that shoulder tab, and those are your sleeve stitches. Okay. Then for each side. And you can pretty quickly start to try it on and see how it's going to fit. That should just sit on your shoulders. The, the line, unless you want it off the shoulder, like this one I'm wearing, um, is purposely sort of off the shoulder. Yeah. But if you're doing a true set in sleeve, you want that line to come up where a shirt like a blouse would fit, would come up onto the top of your shoulder. Yeah. So that's all that needs to fit. And then you're just going to knit down from there. Here's one that I'm working on now. It's, it looks like a cape until you get to the bottom of the seamless yoke. But you can see how you've got a 3D garment yes it actually is shaped and there sits your shoulder it's not it's not a flat thing so I like the fit better if I'm doing a set in sleeve I really like to use this method then you're going to knit the entire all this light gray is the seamless yoke and for the seamless yoke you are going to have to do increases at different different rates so in the sleeve you're going to be increasing a lot you're gonna go pretty much straight down and increase just under the arm on the front. And then you separately from that, you also have the neckline increases. So to make that easier, we've got a system where you put all those increases onto a worksheet. And I think we'll link to this so you can see it, but um, just roughly, this is the worksheet mm -hmm. and all those vertical lines are, they correspond to the colored markers that are in your knitting. So if you're sitting there knitting and you've got this pile in your lap like this, I don't have to sit and think, oh my gosh, am I in a sleeve in the, here or am I on the back? Where am I? If I see a colored marker, yeah. I look at my worksheet and I can see, oh, by the colored marker, by the orange marker, I need to do an increase before but not after, whatever it is. So it just tracks everything for you. Um, the subtitle of the book was actually, You Can Drink and Knit. <laughs> my editor didn't like that <laughs> but you can't drink when you're putting your initial uh, figures in can you I always say you can drink and knit but not until you've filled out your worksheet yeah and yeah. then you can pour the wine <laughs> <laughs> I can see how that would also teach you to understand the physical anatomy of a sweater totally um 
because each one is separate so you can choose the part that works for your body. So for instance, I will oftentimes start with a large and uh, for the shoulders because I'm kind of broad shouldered and so I oftentimes like a little bit more ease up in the top. Let me grab one here that is done that way. This is Lizzie from the book and this one I started with a large because I like, I'm broad shouldered and so I like kind of a, a bigger, a more generous, a little more ease at the top. I don't have the bust of a large. So when I go to fill out the worksheet, I fill out the worksheet for a medium. So I go from large and then I choose medium for this part. Medium sleeve is fine. You know, you can, you can pick and choose the parts that work for you and sort of put them together. So it's a really um, nice way to knit, to customize without having to do a lot of um, math and refiguring. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And you've also developed some special knitting techniques that give a neater finish with this method. Can you go through some of those? Yeah, I found when I was doing this that uh, I tried everything. I really did. And there were certain, because the whole sweater hangs off of these foundations, these pickups, these um, increases, I really needed something especially sturdy. So I did, I, I messed around until I came up with really um, specific techniques for this. And they're all videos on our website. So you can go and, and look at them. There's also a um, handout you can, you can print for yourself right off of the website um, to kind of have handy as you're working these so you can see how to do it. But they do make a difference. They really are, um, they really do help to get the best result. So are they more about just making sure that you've got a strong skeleton for the, for the garment to hang on? Or is it also about, do you have different techniques for doing short rows or finishing and things like that? The only place you use short rows um, in these sweaters, you don't have to use them in the, in the shoulder. That's what's so nice. Um, but I do use short rows for bust starts and I love shadow wrap short rows. And we've got a um, video for that on the website too. Um, and the techniques up in here are really about, it's a really neat looking finish and really strong. So they're both, um, that's the reason for these specific techniques um, on the tops of the sweaters. And I think a lot of them come from production knitting. So knitting for the ready to wear industry is different from hand knitting. And I definitely pulled over some techniques. When I came to hand knitting, I was surprised at some of the things that hand knitters do that made no sense to me. <laughs> so so I, we have a lot of those tips on the, on the website as well. Can you show us now a selection of Coco Knits designs? Talk about their design features and the skill level that's required to knit them. So my uh, inspiration and where I start from designing, I usually don't sort of start with a stitch pattern and try and build a sweater around it. I'm completely the opposite. I, because, I think because I came from, from ready to wear and production knitting, I think about the person, who she is, where she's going, what is she going to wear this with? What is the need that I can kind of fill? And then what is the most streamlined way to get to that? So for instance, um, the basic beginner sweaters in the book. Uh, these are all Emma sweaters. This is the boat neck. These are all the same construction. This is the V-neck version of that, which is hard to see in black. This is the cardigan that I also um, have been using for the, to, to um, illustrate this. This is the Emma cardigan. Here it is without the color blocking, showing yeah. you the different sections. Um, just a really easy to wear, easy, easy cardigan. More of mine are going to be stockinette stitch. I'm very inspired by yarns. Like even what I'm wearing, you don't need a, anything super fancy if you've got fabulous yarn. I would rather have a really simple garment that fits well, that's easy to wear, and just lets the yarn sing. So for instance, those are the, the three of the really basic ones. This is also an Emma sweater done in blue sky brush surrey so it's just as soft as can be so yeah. when you've got yarn that lovely i feel like just a really nice simple um design is fine um this is also in the book this is 
Molly. This is um, indigo dyed yarn from uh, Swan's Island. This is a Shibui. I used two yarns held together to get that kind of ragwool look, yeah. which is really fun. But again, super, super simple, um, but easy to wear. Easy to wear and just beautiful, beautiful yarns. Uh, also in the book is this kind of just wrap. It's sort of in between a sweater and a wrap. Um, these are both the same. This one is cotton and this one is um, two Shibui yarns held together. But again, easy to wear and gorgeous yarn. All right, and then we've got a, a lot of follow-up patterns. So I've done a lot of follow-up. We couldn't fit all of the patterns in the book. There turned out to be over 20 patterns. And so I keep adding, it will clearly say on the website and on the pattern, it is a Coco Knits method pattern. So it's written using the worksheet. That's the main thing. Um, and just to see some follow-up, I also have some that are cabled. There's a, there's a cabled one called Kiki. This one is called Rosa, but you can see how nice the English tailoring and this technique works in something that does have a stitch pattern. Yeah, it so has a real those, design feature at the back. Yeah, yeah. It's so, I love how that looks. And the, and the one with cables is, is fun too, but I just don't have that sample here. Uh, so we've done a lot of um, follow-up. And then this little guy is a, this again is great. It's really fun yarn. It's called iCat from um, Swan's Island. And this, the uh, front ribbing splits. So you can tie that if you want. Splits at the side. You're knitting down so you can make any part of this longer or shorter. Um, but again, really fun yarn. So why not do something fairly simple? Yeah, the yarn's stunning. This is uh, called Amy. This takes no time to knit up on size, well, huge needles. But just again, a really fun little wrap. Um, and then I've got uh, Coco Knits Modified. This uses the same methods. You can see uh, this one is called Sarah. So it uses that same method to build the shoulders, but then the sleeves are knitted separately, picked up and knitted separately. Okay. But this is a... Um, so that's a drop a shoulder. Half -ish. I use those same techniques. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and those are modified coconuts method. But yeah, we've got a ton on the website. This one I just finished. This is fun. This is um, Nomad Noose yarn a little bubble sleeve and the whole thing is done in a uh, garter stitch with an i-cord edging that runs you knit the i-cord edging as you go so again when you're done all you do is close the underarm seam so they all look like they're fairly beginner level skill level for the most part the the shoulder method you have to learn and then everything else is fairly simple isn't it I think so. I mean, if someone's having trouble with it, they don't want to hear that because <laughs> it wasn't simple to me. Um, yeah. It works really well with stripes too. This one is called Madeline and it's black and white striped on the website. But I just had a bunch of this yarn from Little Gray Sheep um, in the UK. Yeah. And just to show you how well this works with stripes, um, it's just so neat. So you can use it as a template and put your own patterning in if you wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. Color blocking, add um, color work. They're very, once you get, once you see how it works, um, and then this one is the exact same pattern as this, but with no stripes and it's knitted with absolutely sheer silk mohair. That yeah. is just, it's like wearing gossamer. It's beautiful. Now, two commonly asked uh, fitting problems are, uh, for example, what happens if your upper arms are larger in comparison to your, to your bust size? Or what happens if you're very narrow shouldered and you've got a very large bust? So how would a knitter make these kinds of adjustments to a coconut sweater? Great question. Um, and that's really what this method does. So I've been teaching all the way through, even when I had um, the knitters in Ireland, I was I was starting to teach and I've been teaching forever. Um, and I 
have come to realize there's no real standard body size. Yes, I use the standard measurements from the Craft Yarn Council of America, but no woman is identical to another for the most part. So that's the thing about this is you can choose the parts that work. So for instance, if you are narrow shouldered, big busted, what I recommend is try it with an Emma to start with, but you can cast on and knit a small or a medium, whatever seems to work for your shoulders and build the shoulders. So you're gonna get this little part done for your shoulder size. Then when you go to fill out the worksheet and knit from there down, we've got the colored markers that, that uh, match with the worksheet to knit that part and fill that out for the size that makes sense for your bust. They may not be the same size. I have a good friend who always knits my smaller mediums to start with, and then she goes up to a large for the, for the seamless yoke area. So you can mess around with it, try it on a sweater that's fairly basic to, to figure out what works for you, and then you know that's what you need to do from then on. Um, and the same if you are, uh, you know, if the medium looks like it will fit everywhere, but you want more ease around your sleeve. When you fill out the worksheet, just pick up some extra stitches for the sleeve top. You know, if you, if you start with two extra stitches on the top of the sleeve and otherwise knit the sleeve as is, maybe add a couple extra increases in the sleeve, you've got, you know, you can easily add an inch or two to the sleeve circumference without changing any of the other measurements. So there are lots of ways to tweak the sizing without having to sort of reinvent the wheel and do a bunch of math. <laughs> so it's just easy when you follow the worksheet. I think it helps to have done one and then you kind of see what's going on. It's like, yeah. oh, of course, I can just add some stitches where I need them. So your passion has been to help knitters in two areas that a lot of knitters do struggle with. Um, first of all, choosing a garment style that they uh, that suits them and that they really feel comfortable wearing and then making sure that that garment is going to fit their body beautifully. So you've spoken a little bit about the fit. What happens um, when people ask you for advice about garment styles? What are some of the principles that you like to share? And perhaps you can just say a couple of scenarios, common scenarios. I've got a little chapter in the book on this as well. And it comes down to sort of um, balance. The eye seeks balance. And so if you are heavy on top, you probably don't want a lot going on up here. Um, and if you're heavier on the bottom, you probably do want some horizontal lines and more on the top. And that's just more a matter of balance than it is judging about what anyone wears. But for instance, um, if you are um, heavier on the bottom, you wanna think about drawing the eye up with either horizontal lines up here, um, and then the opposite is true. I like, for instance, to get some vertical lines up on the top. And another thing that, um, makes it can make a big difference is sleeve length. So if you think about where your sleeve ends on your garment, again, if you're busty, you probably don't want a sleeve that ends right up where you already feel <laughs> the, your biggest, um, because that's gonna draw the eye up to that point. Um, you may want to have a longer sleeve that draws the eye down and gets more vertical lines. And then the opposite is true if you're, if you're hippier, you may want lines, horizontal lines up at the top. So you can kind of think about all kinds, like where lines are all over on your body. And I think about that when I'm designing the sweaters, about where to, and that, that's the nice thing, you're knitting down. You can make the sleeve as long or as short as you want. Um, and same with, this, with the body length of the sweater. Whether it's cropped or you want to make it longer, you have those options. But I do have a little chapter in the book with some points about that. It's also interesting what you talked about with arm uh, shapes of sleeves as to whether you have a bell shape or whether you have it tapered or you know where you want to put bulk if you want to have um, really bulky yarns or where, they, where they're going to be, you know, where you might put extra cables and things. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And where you put, um, like I've got a little bell sleeve sweater and I put it down at sort of the waist area where it, mm -hmm. where it starts to bell out. Um, you could put it up higher if you wanted to. 
it, get rid of it completely. You don't have to have it at all. But there are some things to think about like that, yeah. And, and you can try these sweaters on pretty quickly once you get going and see where, you know, look in the mirror and figure out where you want that bulk if you want it. Okay, and Coco Knits is also known for its high quality tools and you love the tools. You designed a lot of them. In fact, you designed all of them, some completely by yourself and others with the help of an engineer. Can you show us a selection of say your favorite tools sure. or some of the more unusual ones and also talk about what it was like to work together with an engineer to create beautiful ergonomic tools for knitting? Um, it's really fun. So like I say, I started with the knitter's block way back when. It's important for me to also do eco-friendly. I don't feel like the world needs any more plastic um, or any more, you know, chemicals. For instance, with the knitter's blocks, they are made with formaldehyde and formidide-free foam. Um, a lot of the, the plastic, plasticky, foamy things that people use to block um, are maybe not as eco-friendly. So anyway... There's that. Uh, and then we started in with the uh, Maker's Keep, which you can wear as a bracelet or you can slide this down and use it as a straight edge, but it's got a magnet on it. And every tool we do pretty much sticks to magnets. So the row counter, you can use it with or with, you don't have to use the magnet, but if you have trouble keeping track of your <laughs> tools, everything sticks to the magnet. So the stitch fixers, the cable needles, the tapestry needles, the row counter, they all stick to magnets. I use specific colors of uh, stitch markers for a reason. They correspond to a vertical line in the worksheet. So you can easily, while you're sitting there watching TV or having a glass of wine, you can see exactly where you are in your knitting because they it all matches up. Okay. So yeah, so... <laughs> Um, that's why the colored markers. And we just did this fun little um, flight of stitch markers. So they all come in six colors, but every type of marker is in here. And these also all work with magnets. Okay. So whether you use our Maker's Keep or whether you just throw a magnet into your knitting kit, hopefully you're not going to lose them down the cracks of the sofa. That's um, great, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a cleaner. You just put the magnet in and it sucks up everything. <laughs> exactly, yes. Um, and then the other tool that was really fun uh, to design, I knit so many sweaters, top down, seamless. And here's my latest one I'm working on. So now you can kind of see it's becoming, I'm in the seamless yoke and it's becoming a... Uh, it looks more like sort of a cape now, but it's going to become a sweater. When I get down to the bottom of the seamless yoke, <clears throat> I've got to take these sleeve stitches off onto a holder, finish the body, and then go back and knit the sleeves down. And I did that so much that I got tired of having to find a spare needle to leave in there. Or uh, if I use scrap yarn, the stitches kind of get lost up in, you know, they start to run up in and you've got to dig them back out. So I came up with this uh, leather cord. We've got this smooth leather cord and this needle is threaded on the inside. So you literally screw the little needle onto the leather cord and it sticks and I take the stitches off on to the leather cord. This unscrews and I can just knot the leather and leave them. And that allows me to try the sweater on. Unlike the safety pin style stitch holders, this is nice and soft. Then when I'm ready to when I'm ready to use those stitches again, I just screw this needle back on, and now I can knit right off of it. It's ah, just like a circular needle. I that just is knit so right good. off of it. I've got a garment at the moment, it's top down and I've got about five, actually probably even six, because it's in a crazy amazing construction. I've got about six needles holding different sets of stitches on. <laughs> so I can really value that. <laughs> yeah, so the kit comes with two sort of short cords and then one really long one and two needles so it should be enough to sort of whatever you have to hold hopefully <laughs> um yeah and then this just came out this is a needle gauge so if you're traveling and you need to size your needles um this fits into a, a, my little knitting kit you know the big rectangular or wooden ones are fine when i'm at home 
This is a little tiny guy that just fits in my little knitting kit. And it's made of something called PLA. It's completely biodegradable. This is the same material they use in 3D printing. If you have to have a medical um, sort of part put into your body that will disintegrate, this yeah. is what they use because it turns ah. into basically cornstarch in ah. water. So okay. <laughs> this wow. is the latest one. So what was it like to work with the engineer? It's really fun because he is, um, the, you know, he's not a knitting engineer. I don't think he has any idea what most of this stuff is that he's helping me with. But I sketch it out and I try and explain it to him and I send it to him and he makes his beautiful CAD drawings down to 0.1 millimeters. Um, and we just kind of go back and forth. We've been working together for so many years now that he's like, oh, now what? <laughs> so they all solve a problem to me. Like that's the part of the creativity. Okay. I don't just come out with something... Um, you know, for no reason, just to kind of come up with something. It's because I'm knitting all the time and I have a problem that needs to be solved. So one of them was also these stitch stoppers. When you're knitting like this, it is great to be able to try it on. But when you go to try it on, oftentimes you think you're being careful and then next thing you know, all your stitches have come off your needles. Yeah. And this, the tips that you could buy did not work for me. And so I did these really squidgy, soft um, foam ones, again, formaldehyde free, that slip all the way onto the needle and really stay on. So that was a problem that needed to be solved. Everything okay. I do is sort of like, there's a reason for this. So whenever I have a problem, I come up with a solution and it means a new tool. <laughs> Well, it's been really interesting to to hear about your in more detail about your method and certainly your tools. I'd like to finish now, but with one more question that's a little bit more personal. So you, I know that you've got a 20 year old daughter who is very disabled and needs constant care, and you actually built your business around caring for her. So that must have been extremely challenging. And I can also imagine that it would have pushed you to be very efficient with your time and also to make sure that you've always got a really constructive attitude. And I'm really interested to hear how you managed to do this. So are you able to share with us? <laughs> Um, maybe any principles that you developed or used to help you do this that might also help other people who are either building up their own businesses or just trying to cope with their own set of life circumstances. Yes, yeah, so my daughter is 24 years old now and she does require a lot of care. She started to have um, seizures at about 11 months and um, just a lot of we were just in and out of the hospital for a long time. Um, and that's when it became, well, I actually took a complete break from knitting for, uh, for about seven years uh, just to care for her and kind of get our heads around the, you know, first the medical and then the fact that she was, uh, you know, going to need care for her whole life. So, um, I think knitting finally came back in after about a seven year break and really was my release, my creative outlet, um, something that I could do for myself. And it made a huge difference to be able to, I mean, I was just to the point where all I did was care for her and worry about her and it just starts to drive you crazy. And so having a saying, okay, you know, I always thought it was selfish to do anything for myself when she needed me. But at some point, if you go over the edge, you're no good to anyone. So you also need to look out for yourself a little bit. And so I finally got back into knitting and found that it was um, not a, a luxury. It was a necessity. It was really the, the what I needed for myself so that I could be there for her and for my other daughter. Um, so... I was able to luckily work from home so I could kind of balance both and um, just started to put hours and hours and hours in. I, I did have to be around home a lot. And so, you know, that's the good news and the bad news. I had a lot of time to knit and a lot of meetings to knit through. And um, 
So I did put in just hours and hours and hours of knitting and work. And it, these were all sort of creative problems that I could solve. Mm-hmm. I couldn't fix my daughter. Yeah. Um, and that I have just had to learn to um, sort of work around and accept. But but I could pick up those stitches. I could figure out a better way to design a sweater. I could figure out um, these are problems I could solve. And that was really mentally... Um, therapeutic. Fan- so therapeutic, yeah. And yeah. I think with the tools too, like it's just pure joy to be able to connect with knitters, to really feel like I've helped and really um, maybe, you know, hopefully brought some joy to someone else. Um, because that's, you know, that's what we got to do. We got to look out for each other and um, try and make each other happy because you never know when, you know, what's coming down the pike. So take that's it's true. good to take care of yourself, look out for each other and, um, you know, look for some creative outlet that is actually really important. And and was building the the business was that also a real joy for you that the business side of it and building a team that you could work with? Yes, I am so lucky. We're an all all woman. We all love what we do, and we work really well together. We're all remote, um, but we all check in with each other every day. And we our goal, all of us, is to make others happy. Like we just hope that our products make people happy, that our service makes people happy, that people are happy with the outcome um, because that's not how life always is. So if we can help in any way, we're so happy (laughs) to do that. (laughs) Well, it's been really great to have you on Fruity Knitting. So thank you for giving us your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Goodbye. Hope to see you at Coconuts. (laughs) 